who knows that it's okay to get a little bit emotional in church sometimes. That's okay, right? Because these are like really important things that we're talking about. And I love that uh, having just finished or nearly finished a series where we've been talking about love like this, we have just been presented with two really practical ways that we can love like this. We can buy a gift or we can make a donation to uh, a family who are doing it tough, or we can think about um, the trafficking of people. And so you might be thinking, I don't have 31 dresses. That seems like quite a commitment. Uh, And it is also Christmas, so that's an expensive time of the year. You don't have to wear 31 dresses. You could just donate uh, to Laura and Kira who are doing it. Or uh, I know there's information that comes out all the way through December, which I'm sure Laura and Kira will be posting on their Facebook page. And so Maybe if you're not friends with them, you could friend request them um, and you could read that information and just make yourself more aware about human trafficking and maybe pray for the issues that are raised over the month of of December. And in that way, we can all be joining together uh, to love like this, which I think is an incredible practical way that we can put, you know, we can actually do this, um, what we've been talking about. Well, oh heck, my my, uh, battery is on 10% with my notes on it. So here we go. It could be a choose your own adventure this morning. (laughs) Come Holy Spirit. Okay, well, we're talking about hospitality uh, and I'm excited to talk about hospitality because I love hospitality. Uh, I love people, I love food and I love evangelism, which is really just a fancy way to say talking about Jesus. Um, And for me, I really believe that hospitality ticks all of those boxes. I think it is a spiritual principle that we are called to as followers of Jesus. And so I love that as we talk about love like this, one of the central kind of pillars of how we do that is by engaging in hospitality. When I uh, was a teenager, my auntie was a Salvation Army officer. Actually, she was a major in the Salvation Army. And so she uh, hadn't lived in South Australia through kind of my childhood. But in my teens, uh, her and her husband, who was also a major, came to live in Adelaide and they came to um, to pastor the core, that's what they call it in the Salvation Army, in the city, Adelaide Congress Hall. And so in my teens, we didn't attend that church, but sometimes on a Sunday, we would go to their house for lunch. And there were six people in my family There were four people in her family. And so we would go to their place for lunch after they had, you know, ministered to their community. There would be 10 of us, but there was never, ever 10 people at their table. There was always more people at their table because they always would invite people to come to this meal in their home. It would often be, uh, you know, uni students whose parents were also officers and maybe lived in different parts of Australia or uh, uni students who didn't have family connections maybe. Can I please have my cup of tea? It's the worst when you can hear that little sound. (laughs) Or, you know, uh, just people that were on the outskirts. And so they would invite them in to be around their family table. And sometimes there would be up to 20 people all kind of squished around this table. And it just always struck me that a meal at their house always felt like a celebration. It always felt like a party to be invited to be around their family table. And what I noticed as, I, uh, as we went periodically to their home for lunch was that around their table, these young people were being encouraged, they were being inspired, they were being discipled, they were being heard, and it was all happening around a meal, a humble meal at their home. And I, I just... I loved being a part of that meal. I really did. It was a really special time for me and something that I still remember. You know, we, I think we're pretty obsessed with food in our kind of, in our our lives, aren't we? We, you know, we watch uh, MasterChef and then Celebrity MasterChef and then Kids MasterChef and we watch My Kitchen Rules uh, and we watch all of these food shows like Nigella. I used to teach Nigella to my year 12s as an English uh, (laughs) communication study and they were surprised and shocked to learn some of the things that I would teach them about Nigella. 
Nigella, um, Pose Kitchen, you know, all of those kind of shows. I love Jamie Oliver. In fact, I watched Jamie Oliver with Ruby. She loves watching cooking shows with me. But we, we kind of, we love the idea of food, but I think sometimes we watch these shows and we get inspired by these shows and we buy a cookbook and have heaps of cookbooks in our cupboard. But the idea of actually making the food and inviting people around for a meal is exhausting to us. It maybe even fills us with dread and terror, the idea of having people over for a long, lazy lunch, perhaps, where we kind of linger over food and we spend time in community with each other. We love the idea of it, but we're busy, aren't we? We're busy. Sometimes, you know, I don't know if, what it's like in your home, but I know uh, as we were teenagers and we would get our jobs and we were all so busy that we didn't even, often, we didn't even eat meals together because somebody was working and somebody was at sport and people were kind of in and out and my dad was running a business and, you know, we all had things and so we'd, we maybe we eat at the bench and then kind of hire by and sort of leave, skip out on each other or, I don't know, maybe you as a family, you just get home and you're so tired at the end of the day that you kind of collapse in front of the TV and you just eat food, watching TV or trolling the internet and you forget maybe that people are even present with you while you're eating your meal. I wonder, I wonder if maybe we have lost the art or the spiritual discipline of hospitality because we're tired. But the good news is that the Bible actually teaches us about hospitality. The Bible has something to share with us about why hospitality is good and the way that God invites us in. And so I want to share a story with you this morning that I think is a really interesting uh, story about hospitality. And it, it comes from the Gospel of Mark which is the second gospel in the New Testament, if you are new to reading the Bible. And we're reading out of chapter 6, which is the big number. Chapter 6 and verse 30. It says, The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. And then Jesus said, go off by yourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. And so they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to nearby villages and farms and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what? They asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. And then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in, the, in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish and he looked up to heaven and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. 
after telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. I really want to focus on two kind of parts of this story this morning. The first one is that uh, I think that we see here that Jesus in- invites his followers to feed people physically and spiritually, that both are at play here. But the second thing is that in order for us to sustain a lifestyle or a culture of feeding people, we actually need to rest that that comes out of a place of rest, out of Sabbath, out of resting in Jesus and knowing who Jesus is, out of being revived by him. Notice in verse 35 that Jesus suggests to the crowd that they need to feed the people. They're saying, like, we need to send these people home because we can't possibly feed them. It's ridiculous which I actually think is such a funny thing that the disciples cannot possibly fathom that the God of the Jews, the God of the Israelites, because that's who they are, right, who has actually supernaturally fed hundreds of thousands of people in their history, the idea of him feeding them is like, what? It's, I think that's a really fascinating little tidbit. Uh, but in 35, it says, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, it's a remote place, like a desert. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away and, and they can go to nearby villages and farms and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. Not spiritually, This isn't pie in the sky, you know, some sort of metaphorical moment that Jesus is trying to include the disciples in. He's actually being really practical. He's saying, no, no, they're hungry. Feed them. You feed them. I I can't imagine being a disciple in that moment being like, um, okay. I'm not quite sure how to do that. But I think it's interesting that Jesus recognises that we actually have physical needs. He knows that about us. He recognises about us that we have physical needs that need to be fulfilled and sustained. He understands that food, it actually helps people to hear. I have one child who, oh my goodness, if she has not got food in her little body, turns into... I mean, I don't even want to say. (laughs) She rages and it's so embarrassing because I think people are like, "Um, are you, do you know how to parent? (laughs) Yes, I do, but I just don't always have crackers with me, okay? So (laughs) so I don't know if you're like that, but God knows that, you know, we need food. Like it actually adjusts the chemical reaction in our body and food makes us feel loved. When we, when we sit around that family table, it's the food. It doesn't matter what it is, but food makes us feel loved. It makes us feel connected to other people. It's the great equaliser. And so in this moment, Jesus is encouraging his disciples to feed people, to consider what their physical needs are, and to wonder or be curious about how we can be involved in the practical task of taking care of people's physical needs. And I believe that that's not just a call to the disciples in this story in Mark. I believe that's a call to us as followers of Jesus to be considering what is it that I could do practically to supply for the needs of people in my community and in doing that, feeding them physically, how can I be communicating something spiritual to people? You know, uh, a couple of years ago, I became super convinced that I needed to run Alpha, the Alpha program. And what I came to love about the Alpha course was that actually the most central part of Alpha is about food and community and making people feel connected. And in the process of that, they meet Jesus. And it is incredible. And so 
it wasn't really uh, something that my my church necessarily had the idea that they wanted to do. It was just a personal sense that I really believe that God is calling me to try Alpha. And so I didn't I didn't gather people at the church. It didn't have to be like a proper program. I just thought I'm going to give this a go. And so I just opened my house first to a bunch of girls. Um, and, and it, it shocked me. It shocked me the way that these people came into my home. I didn't know them, but within like three weeks, they were so excited to come to my house. And it was the bit where we ate food together. In fact, we, um, we affectionately started calling it Waffle Club <laughs> because it's, it was about coming and having food. And sometimes it was waffles and sometimes it was pancakes and sometimes it was charcuterie. It didn't matter what it was, but we all gathered together. We ate food together. We got to know each other. And then in the midst of that, we got to tell these girls and then there's more people because then we did another one and then we did another one and just got bigger and bigger. And we got to tell people about who Jesus was. And in fact, we got to represent the church to people who were never, ever going to come into a church until they did this program. And then they met Jesus and then they wanted to be involved in a community because they felt loved in that space. You know, that reminds me of the stories that we see all the way through the Gospels of the way that Jesus engaged with people around food. He would go into people's homes. He would go to parties. He would, uh, he would invite himself over. How much of a boss is Jesus that he just says, I'm coming to your house for lunch today? I wonder if that would change the way that we did community. If instead of waiting for an invitation, we just said, hey, Martin, I'm coming to your house for lunch today. Good? Awesome. I'm guessing we'll get chicken and chips. (laughs) Uh, I love that Jesus, he constantly communicates to people around food and community. Because it bonds us and it equalizes us and because it helps us to find common ground and commonality and because it opens up opportunities for us to minister to people's physical needs and to their spiritual needs. Because following Jesus isn't just a spiritual pursuit. It's a physical thing. Like we enact habits, they're physical habits that lead us to know him more and to love him more by doing things physically. Uh, In Mark 8, verses 1 to 3, it says about this time, so this is the second time that Jesus feeds people. He does it once to a really big crowd, then he does it a second time to a smaller crowd, but still a really big crowd. And he says about this time, Mark says, about this time another large crowd had gathered, and the people ran out of food again. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They've been here with me for three days and they have nothing left to eat. What a party. If I send them home hungry, they will faint along the way, for some of them have come a long distance. Again, we see Jesus caring about people's physical needs. It's a really practical consideration. What does this person need to live well, to hear well, to be okay? So they won't get hungry and they won't get sick because God knows that we have human bodies with human needs, but also that we are spiritual beings with spiritual needs. And he wants to minister to both of those things. We see here that Jesus kind of engages in this dual ministry of dealing with the physical and dealing with the spiritual. If we go back to uh, chapter 6, in verse 34, it says, A huge crowd... Um, stepped as he stepped away from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and so he began teaching them many things he saw their physical needs but he also saw their spiritual needs he didn't just feed them 
And I think that's the thing about being a community of believers is it's hard to get that tension right. There's a real wrestle, I find. There's a real wrestle between how do we make sure that we are practically engaging in people's physical needs, but also not forgetting that people are spiritual beings who have spiritual needs. And Jesus, he had compassion on people. I think there's a key there that when Jesus looked at people, he looked at them with compassion, with love. He cared for who they were and he calls us to the same ministry. Feeds people's spirits. You know, I often imagine that meal and think, what would that have looked like? Thousands of people. I know how hard it is just for us to distribute the emblems among these many people it's kind of messy and you know we've talked about what do we do do we keep the foil wrappers because they're so noisy and maybe we could get people to move around and get some bread and but the practical the practicality of that is uh, it's a group of people all getting up and moving around that seems like it would be pretty tricky imagine multiplying that by thousands of people because that's what happens in this story. But can you imagine the the sense of community as there was no food and now suddenly Jesus has prayed and thousands of people are eating and they sit in groups of 50 and 100. It would have felt like a kingdom party, I think, as food. It says they all ate their fill and more and more. It's like the best buffet of all time and everybody can touch it because there's no COVID. So they're just getting in there. It's like, you know, fish and bread and like pulling the fish off with the bread. I feel you can tell I love food. No rushing to be somewhere else. No phones to distract us. Nowhere else to be. Just being with people, present and reveling in this moment where this God, Jesus, God incarnate, is manifesting himself again in the way that he had all of those years earlier by providing provision, people's food and sustenance. I reckon that bread would have been unbelievable. Sometimes I think about the person that supplied, is it a little boy? It's a little boy, right? Who supplied that bread. Probably his mum who packed that bread for him. And he comes home, mum, guess what? (laughs) My little, the bread that you needed, that you made, that you cooked in this oven, Jesus turned that into a party, kingdom party for thousands of people today. I think she would have said, "Uh." (laughs) maybe she was there. Let's assume she was there. You know, you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, sounds fantastic, Erin. It really does. It sounds like a really great way to live our lives, to, to think about people's physical needs and to think about people's spiritual needs and to engage in hospitality. But What you're missing, Erin, is that it's nearly December. And, you know, I've had a year. I have. I've had a year. It's been tough. And I'm actually just tired. And the idea of slow food, of slow hospitality, of inviting people into my home and cooking together and and then sitting down for like three courses and not knowing when that person is going to leave my house or maybe inviting a neighbour who... We do this too, but they have a different opinion about things to me and they're pretty vocal about it. I'm not sure I want to get stuck in a room where they're telling me their life story. It actually all sounds really hard. Yes. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Remember we said that there's treasure, that joy is the treasure in the hard. I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat it. Yes, it can be hard. And yet, it's a spiritual discipline because it's here in the word because Jesus fed people and he said, you feed them. And so being hard isn't enough reason for us to not engage in it. But I think that Jesus gives us this really sneaky little key about how to engage in hospitality. And it's in verse 30. Uh, Sorry. Let me just read my notes because I'm way off track. (laughs) 
In verse 30, right at the beginning of the story, we see that the disciples have returned from a ministry trip. And his response to them is, you actually need to rest. You need to take some time to rest. In verse 31, it says, let's get away from the crowds for a while and rest. And so the thing that I think is really important to notice here is that there is no way that we can engage in this type of hospitality if we don't also pay attention to our own physical needs. You know, we, we started talking about the principle of Sabbath a few months back, and I know that a bunch of people said, ah, oh, amazing. I can't wait to try that. It's going to be hard with little people, but you know, well, I've been a Christian for so many years and that sounds phenomenal. I can't wait to try it. But it's amazing how quickly our habits return to us. Even when we decide, yeah, I want to engage in that process of Sabbath, that we get back into the kind of the busy and I would suggest that if the idea of having people in your home or going to a restaurant, if having people in your home is too much for you, or going to a park or whatever it is, the way that you're going to engage in hospitality, if that all seems way too hard, I would suggest step back to the Sabbath step. Because if you are not rested, if you're not resting in Jesus if you're not delighting in who he is and taking 24 hours to turn off your phone, to not respond to work emails, to not do shopping and things, but to just rest. Yeah, hospitality is going to feel really, really tricky. But I really think that we can do it. You know, uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this passage is that, yes, Jesus does, he says, rest, right? So they're going to go and rest. And then suddenly there's the crowd and Jesus has compassion on them. So then they go back into ministry and he says, okay, now we're going to feed them. And so they feed them, feed them, feed them. And so you might be thinking, well, Aaron, like, Jesus actually just kept on doing ministry. So I don't know what you're saying. But if you read that passage, I think one of the most beautiful little insights is that at the end of feeding the people, the crowd, once they had all had their fill, the Bible specifically tells us that there were 12 baskets of food left over. It's the exact number of disciples the disciples that we learn at the beginning haven't eaten and are hungry because they've been involved in ministry. And you know, Jesus' provision for the disciples in their moment of ministry is mind-boggling to me. Because I promise you that if you make the choice to engage in hospitality, in loving people practically and spiritually, that Jesus is not going to forget your needs. And this scripture reminds me that he knows you, that he sees you, and that he wants you to have your fill. You know, uh, at the beginning when I was telling you that story about my family, and sitting around that table, I was thinking about it as I was going to sleep last night and thinking, why was that such a big deal to me? Why was engaging in that meal so important? And I realised that I didn't have cousins and extended family. On my dad's side, we didn't see that family at all. On my mum's side, there were Salvo officers and so they were all over Australia. And so I didn't actually ever have that big extended family, you know, sitting around, being a family together, seeing all the cousins and playing experience. And so when it happened in my mid-teens, it was, it was a big deal for me and it obviously left a real mark on me. But as I was thinking about it last night, I thought I did have that experience as a child. I did. It just wasn't with my family. It was through a small group. It was in my church as my family engaged in a small group and we would have 
potluck dinners. I don't know if you had those on a Wednesday night. Home fellowship, it was called. And we would go to home fellowship every single week. And we would, you know, we'd have to sleep on weird people's beds or whatever it was. But that was my experience of that kingdom party. It was hospitality. And I reckon it was a challenge for my family. In the middle of a week, tired, having all of the other thing commitments that they had. But I experienced family and hospitality through the church, through the church family. And so as the worship team come back up, I want to I just want to suggest two things. One is that God wants us to feed people physically and also spiritually, that it's a spiritual discipline. And so I wonder what you could think about this week, how you could engage practically in that task. Maybe it would be like ring a small group leader and get involved in a small group. Maybe it would be like I said, find somebody and say, we haven't spent time together for a really long time. Please come over and have a meal this week. Let's get out our calendars. Let's not just say we're going to do it. Let's make a commitment. I know life is busy. Let's make a commitment. But the other thing is to just remind us that, you know, first, before we come around our meal table, our family table, before we invite people into that space, I want to suggest that our heavenly father has prepared a meal for us. He has laid a table for us and that he is calling us to his table, to commune with him, to do hospitality with him, to know him, to be fed by him, to be loved by him and seen by him. And out of that rest, out of that space of knowing that we are called first to his table, his kingdom party, that then we would be a people who would cultivate a culture of hospitality. And so as we sing these last couple of songs, I want to invite you into that space to maybe close your eyes and shut out the people around you, but to focus your attention on him as you are invited into his table. May you have your fill this morning. May you have your basket of needs supplied this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, we are nothing without you. We have nothing, but with you, the homeless have a home. The hopeless have hope. Father, we have rest and joy in the name of Jesus. And may we give out of that the offering that you fill in our lives. May we be your vessels, God. May we be those offerings and lay down all that holds us back, God. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.